So thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm Annika Knuppel. I looked at the bidirectional association between weight and waist circumference change with common mental disorder. And I looked at this in the prospective cohort Whitehall 2 cohort you might have heard of. I'll explain a bit more later. So I'm going to start with a bit of background, go into my methods, um, have a huge bit of results because we have lots of time today, which reminds me that I have to set the time, and strengthen the limitations and we're going to end up with some summaries and conclusions. So as we all know, the obesity is, we have an obesity crisis. So I thought I don't really have to put that in my background. But because this is an obesity conference, I think some background on um, mood disorders um, is quite helpful to see that this is a very, very relevant topic. So in Europe, one in seven people will be affected by any mood disorder at least once in their lifetime. So this is both anxiety disorders as well as depressive disorders. Depression influences social, work and domestic activities. It's associated with physical diseases and has even been associated with mortality. So it's a very relevant thing to look at mental disease. And finally, mental health problems do lead to an economic and social cost. In England, this was estimated to be about 105.2 billion pounds per year. So what's the state of the art when it comes to weight change and depression? As you've seen in the talks before, many people work on it. And I, when I, I just put up a few, few papers that I look at this. However, there are a number of studies have looked at this and they do find associations in both directions. So both mental disorder affecting obesity as well as obesity affecting mental disorders. Some of them find associations with weight loss, which we might not expect. So associations are not always linear, but sometimes U-shaped. And there is a strong evidence for this both direction effect. So how could these two be associated? I'm just picking out a few potential mechanisms. So some of them you've already heard, the HPA axis and cortisol, inflammation, health behaviors, stigma has been seen to explain a lot of the association between obesity and depression, but might also be relevant for the other way around. And there's lots of factors we don't know about. So if some of these factors can show an association from adiposity going to depression, there are also a couple that are relevant from depression to adiposity. So very unclear how the direction is. And why do we, why does the directionality matter? Well, if we know the temporal sequence and the direction of the association, then we know where our target is. Because the question is, where do we start? And where is, when is the right timing to intervene? And maybe we have to monitor people, people's weight, or do we have to monitor people's mental health? So one way to look at this are so-called time lag models. And what we're doing in time lag models, we can only do them when we have three time points. So we can have a weight change only if we want to use measured data. We can only have a weight change from one to the other point. But then we could look at time point two at our outcome. So for example, the outcome of common mental disorder. The problem that we have when we look at this, we kind of have still a bit of cross-sectional analysis going on. Because a weight change is directly at the same time as we measure our outcome. So the idea of lag models is that what if we lag our outcome later on? So what we look at, we look at the same moment of change, but we look at our outcome at time point three. So there's no cross-sectionality going on anymore, and we have a time lag model. And the idea is that the time lag model will tell us the real temporal se sequence and might give us some idea what the causal relationship is. So has this done before when we look at depression and obesity? Well, and weight change, yes it has, but these two studies have, so they did it in exact way that I'm gonna present to do it, looking at a U-shaped, potentially U-shaped association, but they had a few differences and that's quite relevant um, 
problems. So one of them was restricted to a female sample. Um, the other one didn't look at incident mood disorder, which means a new case of mood disorder. And we need to look at that if we want to see if it's a causal factor again. Because if what someone was depressed already in the first place, and then they gained weight, we don't know, and they were depressed again, we don't know what came first. And finally, both of them used self-reported weight and waist circumference measures. And this is obviously an issue because lots of things will affect whether we know that we've changed our weight. So somebody who constantly monitors their weight, they may be on a weight loss diet, they know they can tell you exactly what they weighed today and what they weighed three months ago. But if you don't really care and you don't really see differences, you don't realize if you gained three or four pounds. So it's very relevant for us to look at really measured data when we look at weight change. So the aim of our study was to investigate the bidirectional association of objectively measured weight and waist circumference changes with common mental disorder in a cohort of British men and women. And the second was to establish the temporal sequence with these so-called time lag models that I explained to you before. So the study cohort is the Whitehall II study. This is an occupational cohort. The civil servants from all 20, I think, um, London ministries on the Whitehall Street have been asked to participate at age 35 to 55 and in 1985 to 1988. And now they've been looked at, I think right now, we just get the new data in from phase 12. So that's uh, loads of time to think about, to change, to measure um, weight and measure your mental health. We had a couple of screening phases and that's the ones we're gonna use. And screening phases means that people have been actually measured in these times, but also measured about lots of other health potential issues or about their health in general. So my main measures of interest were common mental disorder, which is measured with the general health questionnaire. It's 30 questions about the anxiety, depression, and I define cases with a score equals or above five. And so my five week weight change was measured by trained staff, and I categorized weight change so I can pick up on potential U-shaped associations. For the statistical analysis, we used random effects models. So what you can see here are all the different phases that we have measured data from. So to be able to use all this data in random effects models, we can run one model over a five year cycle from one to three, three to five, five to seven, seven to nine, and then run them parallel as if every person was an extra participant. What we take into account though, is that obviously th these people are more similar to themselves than to other people. So we can take into account this effect when, with this within person a correlation. So this allows us to lose lots of data um, within this one data set and don't lose anything. And to make sure that when we use those different models, we not exclude people, uh, include people in the first model that we can't include in the second way of looking at the model, we restricted our sample to have exactly the same group of people in both the non-lag and the time-lag model. I use two adjustment models. The base model is always adjusted for age, sex and ethnicity, and then a fully adjusted model um, as I, um, looking at sociodemographic factors, health behaviours, baseline adiposity, and different diseases. So if you look at people, how people's weight changed, um, what you probably would expect, in older age, more people lose weight, and in younger age, more people gain weight. And the same thing for waist circumference, but we can see that there is a lot of high gain, over 5%, uh, gain in young age, more than it is in weight change. Common mental disorder, 
prevalence was higher in participants who were younger, who were women, who were unmarried, smokers, so we have all the health behaviors here, smokers, less physical active, sleep less than seven hours a day, suffer from obesity, as shown before, um, who are of lower grade in the civil service, have cardiovascular disease, and are from non-white ethnicity. And the last three were only significant in further phases. But, so you can see there are lots of um, things that reflect to our talk from Nadine. So many of these factors are involved here. And the overall prevalence, obviously because younger people were more affected, went down over the different phases. So let's go into the main results. So here I'm going to show you first the associations with waist circumference change. And in the first model, you can see the association in the direction of complemental disorder affecting waist circumference change. And we can see a clear um, trend association. And if we look at the fully adjusted model, it still shows this association. However, when we look at how waist circumference changes affected incident complemental disorder, I can see that the association is U-shaped. So both weight uh, waist circumference loss as well as waist circumference gain were associated with incident complemental disorder. So if we now so we now looked at the non-lag, the time lag models, and actually the association between common mental disorder and weight change completely disappeared. The association with waist change and incident common mental disorder, however, still looks kind of similar, um, but is in the end also statistically insignificant. And that was independent of how I adjusted for this. So there seems to be no, in the time lag model, there seems to be no association between waist change and common mental disorder in either direction. So if we look now at the, yeah, so let me summarize that. Bidirectional association, when we look in the non-lag model, but clearly no significant um, association in the time-lag model. So now I'm looking at weight change. We can see a very similar picture. We see a linear association between common mental disorder and weight change and this also holds in the fully adjusted model. So, and here we can actually see that people who had common mental disorder had a lower chance to lose weight. And in the weight change association to comp incident CMD, we see the same thing again, a U-shaped association. So people who lost weight, as well as people who gained weight, had increased odds for incident common mental disorder. So now the interesting part is the time lag model, our idea of what could potentially be a causal or the tempor temporal sequence. So the first model, again, becomes entirely insignificant. So there's no association in the time lag model between common mental disorder predicting weight change. However, the association of weight change predicting incident common mental disorder stays significant and again showing a U-shaped association. So we were asking, well, how is this happening? Why would weight loss increase our chances for incident common mental disorder? So we did some additional adjustments. So one additional adjustment was to look at follow-up disease. So whether people had maybe were just on the way to getting another disease. And that just about made our model insignificant. But really, you can still see there's a clear U-shape. And another, associate, another model we looked at was, what if we exclude people who had antidepressant intake? And again, it got a tiny bit more insignificant. So the association between weight loss was a bit attenuated just to statistical insignificance. However, because we do see still the association, it clearly didn't entirely explain this association, we wanted to know how do these two groups differ. So what we did is we just cross-tabbed people who gained weight and got depressed 
two people who lost weight and got depressed. I wanted to see if there's any characteristics. So for baseline characteristics, participants who had lost weight and got a common mental disorder, they were older and they were less physically active. And also they had more disease, both at the baseline and at the follow-up. So there is a clear, probably, a difference of generation. When we looked at the measures of adiposity, interestingly, the people who lost weight and got common mental disorder were more likely to be, were more obese. And also they mainly gained their weight back. This might mean that there is more of a thing about fluctuation going on. Now, this is very unclear, but clearly this group of people who lost weight um, um, seem to be different to the people who gain weight and who got mental disorder. And finally, we wanted to look at if there's maybe differences in how they experience their common mental disorder. We literally just went through the questions. And only a few stuck out, even though they don't reach statistical significance, and you can see it's only a few people asking them, uh, answering them. But we see that the first question was this felt constantly under strain was more relevant in people who had gained weight and had common mental disorder, maybe suggesting some kind of stress or more like an anxiety type and the other three questions we interpret seem to be a bit more about maybe a stronger effect on the person, maybe a bit um, more um, prominent feeling. So for example, if you feel that your life is entirely hopeless, this sounds like a very extreme case of common mental disorder. So in a summary, there was a bidirectional association of weight changes and common mental disorder in non-time lag models. And there was a significant U-shaped association of weight changes with subsequent incident common mental disorder in the time lag model. So when we come to strength and limitations, we have to remember that this cohort is not representative. And obviously, it's just a middle-aged cohort as well. There might be still some residual confounding we couldn't include and we might not know about. There's also that we have to think that there a study that's going on for so long, and we've been looking for changes for quite a long time. People might have dropped out that had were especially affected either by obesity or by mental health issues. Because if you're depressed or you're feeling low, you might not be open for answering a question where for hours and going to a research center, you might just be, oh, they they go away, I don't want to do this anymore. So we might have a very different sample at the moment now. Further on, obviously, the cut-offs are especially arbitrary when we go to waist circumference change because there's very little on how to measure a cut-off when it goes to waist circumference. And we're restricted to a five-year time frame. So even though the idea of a time length model is great, it might just be that these associations are much more short term. So we can't really measure this long term effect because people have, might have changed over time um, much more. And finally, there was no, we couldn't measure weight loss intention over the entire time. However, we did be, were able to look at a sump sample with people where we knew about whether they had a weight loss intention. And we couldn't see any difference in the association with weight loss. So, however, we do have a lot of strength in this study. We have validated measures. We use measured weight and waist circumference. We can look, could look at incident depression because we have so much time. And we were able to use these time lag models because we had more than three phases of data collection. So in summary, we had and bi found a bidirectional association with both weight and waist circumference changes and common mental disorder. We did find in time lag models that weight loss and gain increased the odds of incident common mental disorder, suggesting that this association might be causal. But this is obviously epidemiological research with a cohort study that can't show causality. And obviously further research will be needed to look at this association maybe in more short term, uh, uh, with more short term follow up. However, this might show that people in middle age, weight monitoring might help to determine people at risk for mood disorders. So 
experience of the way change might be a sign for other things going on. So I'd like to acknowledge my supervisory panel and core office, all the participants in the Whitehall 2 study, obviously the mood food research, and if you're interested in our data set, bona fide researchers can apply to work with our data set over our website. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got 10 minutes left for questions. We can take specific questions on our last talk or general questions to the entire panel, if anybody has got anything. Hi, now. Okay, so there are different associations seen in the literature, and it looks like especially the combination of anxiety and depression seems to be an issue, which I kind of measure with common mental disorder. However, as I said, there is no, with the common mental disorder measure GHQ, it's not possible to really disentangle anxiety and depression, and especially also different types of depression. So are there are thoughts about that different, uh, experiencing different um, symptoms can show if more inflammation is involved or more other things. So there's lots of research on different types of depression. Probably the others contain more because they have data sets that also include subtypes. So we could just look at this combination and can't really disentangle it. It's a reflection. Andy Hill again. It's a reflection on the and your talk, Anna, and it's that lovely relationship that that U-shaped relationship. In, in other words, it's not just about weight weight gain. It's also about weight loss. And it reminds me of the uh, the work that, J that Jason's familiar with as well in laboratory uh, settings where you do mood you do mood inductions, and what you get is when people change their eating behavior, it tends to be one of two directions. Some people respond to low mood or anxiety by overeating, and other people just lose their appetite completely. Um, and it also made me think about what the, the GHQ, and one of the criticisms of the GHQ, or one of the cautions about the GHQ is that it tends to overlook some of the somatic features of anxiety and depression. And of course, one of the diagnostic, one of the diagnostic somatic features of depression is a loss of appetite. So it always seems to me to be slightly strange that we've got this relationship between weight gain, obesity, and depression, whereas one of the key features of depression is appetite loss. So I think it, it, my sort of reflection on this is about cautions about the measures that we use to look at mental health and the degree to which we pick up on these somatic sensations, but also really to commend you on really picking out this complicated bi-directional relationship. For some people it's appetite gain and using food uh, as a way to, uh, to modify their, their own mood, but for other people they just couldn't think of anything worse than eating. They just lose their appetite completely. So not a question really, just simply a reflection. Um, I also have some uh, a, a, a reply to this. So um, I've also done a similar study to Annika, but I did it in the Nesta cohorts where we measure uh, clinical depression. And they also use a, an IDS score, so we know people who eat more and who eats less or who says they gain weight and, and lose appetite and things. And I found similar results to Annika. I didn't use a time lag model, but I found similar results. But the, the most bizarre thing was I also compared those who gained weight and those who lost weight. And those who lost weight started off with higher BMIs. And they were also the ones who said at the baseline they had a greater appetite. So that's kind of bizarre. So we wonder whether it's sort of a over the two year period, you um, have more appetite, you gain weight, but then at the end of the two year period, you'll bounce back to your normal weight. So it was yeah, quite bizarre. And also, don't forget we have the two different depression types: the atypical, uh, who have increased appetite and gain weight, and the melancholic, or more, they um, tend not to eat. Um, I've got a quick question for the last one. Um, due, in, due to the fact your cohort was all working in Whitehall, did you actually control the current government 
at the time, due to the extreme <laughs> stress civil servants get put under, under certain governments in our country who shall remain nameless. Well, I do think that there are actually differences in associations when you um, look at the time of the financial crash. So that's where all kind of, yeah, people are more under strain. Um, well, what we do do is we control for phase. So if there's any difference in the phase, we can take, keep that into account, keep that into account. But yes, there would be a very interesting research overall. I have to say though that many people, especially from the um, lower grades in the civil service, don't stay in there for their whole life. So they were recruited there, but they, that doesn't mean that they still work there. And now most of them are retired anyway. So there is some change, yes. 